Over the last few months, I've had a few people asking me about the Tangem wallet. So I thought I'd go and pick one up, uh, no freebies here, and just do an unboxing setup and review of this wallet. So let's check it out. And if you haven't already done so, hit subscribe and that way you can stay in the loop for content I make to help you find your way in the crazy and often hostile environment that is cryptocurrency. Now, before we go any further, it's worth saying that just as I was putting this video together, Tangem actually released the 2.0 version of their cards. With these new cards coming with two important features that the version 1 cards that I have here don't have. And that is firstly that the version 2 cards support importing BIP39 seeds, though there are some issues around that that I'll talk about a bit later. And these 2.0 cards also have the ability to disable access code recovery. And as you would have seen in that note, the important thing you understand is that the version 1 cards cannot be upgraded to version 2. You cannot do firmware updates with these Tangem cards if you want the new features for the new cards you simply have to buy some new ones all right so this is what you get so this is literally all that was in this box it sort of opens out like this um, but really there's nothing else in there they could have actually just sent this in an envelope people do like fancy packaging so that's what they've done here this basically is just a very basic instruction manual that just tells you to get the app has the terms of service and here are the two cards themselves so basically these are just your standard sort of credit card size devices. These are just NFC smart cards. So obviously they're waterproof and everything else. They don't need batteries and they'll last for a long time. Okay, let's go a bit more in depth with these cards. Right, so it's a Samsung chip. So that is just this one right here, which we can't really get much information about it because most of this sort of stuff is protected by NDA. Though we can actually find things like it's uh, EAL certification criteria and things like that. That's this hardware certification here that you find very heavily promoted in a lot of their marketing. Now, this is a really good spot just to highlight something important about these hardware certification levels in that vendors like Tangem will often, you know, draw lots of attention to the hardware certification level. And in terms of these physical smart cards themselves, EAL 5 or 6 is pretty much normal. So for example, uh, this card here for the Sato chip DIY, that's an EAL 6 Plus card. None of these hardware certifications tell you anything about the software that the vendor is actually running on these cards and whether it's safe or not. This is why it's a bit silly when you see videos with people like trying to scan one with a flipper and being really excited that it just comes up as an unknown ISO tag because you know that is basically what you're going to get for any uh, Java card, smart card or anything else like that. You're not going to get anything useful with a device like a flipper. So let's just run through the basic setup. There we go, so that's the Tangem wallet there, so let's install that. Okay, so let's just say open, scan, pay, exchange, borrow, lend. Yep, so why don't we just say scan card. There we go, scan, success. All right, we'll put that one over there so we don't get them mixed up. So we're going to accept the disclaimer. Now, if you have the version 2 Tangem cards, this is the spot where you actually have an additional option in addition to being able to generate the seeds on the cards themselves. You'll also be able to either create or import a recovery seed. But there's a bit of a catch in terms of how Tangem have implemented this. So the main method that Tangem want you to use is on card wallet creation. This is supported by both the 1.0 and the 2.0 wallets and basically when you create a new wallet the keys will be generated on the primary card then what happens is an encrypted copy of those private keys is sent to your phone when you tap it and then basically what you do is you then tap the backup cards onto the phone the encrypted private keys are sent to the other cards and then decrypted on the card so basically the key thing with this method is that the phone itself never sees the unencrypted private keys nor do you have an ability to you know write them down as a seed phrase or do something else the private keys only exist on the cards themselves. But the seed-based option actually works completely differently. If you're doing seed-based wallet creation or recovery, the Tangem app on your phone is actually what is generating the seed words and converting them to private keys. These private keys are then encrypted and sent to the different cards that you have. And then once that is complete, the private keys and the seed words are deleted from the Tangem app on your phone. But the key difference here between the on-card and the seed-based wallet creation is for seed-based wallets with Tangem, your phone does handle the encrypted private keys during the wallet creation step, though not when you're actually operating the wallet after this. So these trade-offs create a bit of a challenge for Tangem users in that essentially you can choose to have fully on-card uh, seed generation, understanding that that means not having access to your seed phrase, meaning it will be harder down the track to move onto other hardware devices. It might make certain types of recovery more difficult. On the other hand, you can go with a seed-based setup, which does give you much broader compatibility, but also means that your seed phrase and private keys have to pass through your smartphone. 
So let's just walk through the workflow for creating a wallet. So I'll just say create a wallet. To create the wallet, tap the card as shown above and do not remove until the end of the operation. Okay. Success. Backup wallet. You can back up your keys to two other blank tangent cards. Identical cards. All the backup cards are used as full functional identical keys and you'll be able to set the access code to protect your wallets. Restore code. Access code can be restored with one of backup cards. Okay, so if I say backup now, what have we got? All right, well, let's just go with this the way it's intended to be used and we'll say add backup card because like you never ever want to run without a backup. That's just insane. So let's tap the second one on there. Success. One backup card added, right. So these two cards are now the same. We'll say finalize the backup. You've added one backup card. When the backup process is finished, you can't add more backups. If you have one more card, add it to the backup. Would you like to continue? This is a really confusing question. I'm guessing here you'd say cancel if you want to add another backup. So we'll just say continue. Create an access code. You have to set an access code to protect all your wallets. Continue. Access code. So let's just go with... Uh, one, two, three, four. Continue. One, two, three, four. Submit. Primary card. Prepare the primary card with the number. Four, three, two, two. Yep, that's this one here. So we'll say scan the primary card. Long tap. To ensure security, please hold the card until operation is complete. Right, so you can't accidentally do that. So prepare the other backup with the number for, yep, that's that one. Scan the card. Success. Okay, so we just have two cards and we just set the pin, so continue to my wallet. Would you like to use biometrics? Right, so biometrics basically save the pin that we use to access these into the app itself. Let's not worry about that for now. Okay, so this is the app itself. So first things first, let's just send some Bitcoin and some Ethereum there. So it supports... Okay, so it supports native SegWit and legacy, but nothing in between. Oh, that's fine. Bitcoin is on its way. The question is, do we see... Oh, there we go. So we can see the unconfirmed transaction there. So that's nice. Now let's see, did that receiver address change after receiving Bitcoin? No, it did not. Okay, so it just keeps using the same Bitcoin address over and over and over. So terrible for privacy. So let's send this Bitcoin back to the tip address. There we go. And we'll just say max amount. Okay, so tap to sign. Access code, one, two, three, four. Continue. All right. And look, we'll send some Ethereum there too. Okay, and all right. Actions, what we can do here. We can also do swaps. So a bunch of different swaps built into it. Let's say maximum amount. The problem is if we click max, it doesn't actually work it out in terms of the fees. You could like manually decrease the amount before it lets you do a swap. And that's just pushing them through one inch. Okay, so let's just send that Ethereum back. Let's just send the maximum amount. Yep. Tap to sign. So let's just try that one. Uh, what was the pin on that one? We'll just try the two pins we're running. So maybe it's one, two, three, four. Success. Okay. And that worked. Nice and seamless. So let's also have a look at what else we can do. So these are all the different coins that it supports, including tokens that are on a bunch of different chains. And if we go up here, we can actually add custom tokens. So we can pretty much just add, for example, you know, a token on the Ethereum chain. We just put in the smart contract for it there, name, symbol, and so on. 
So the interesting thing here is we can actually change the derivation path for these things. So basically we can also, let's say Bitcoin, right, so we can also add coins themselves on different derivation paths. This is extremely useful if you've accidentally sent something to an address on the wrong chain. So let's be really clear and say that if you are adding in a custom token or something like that, you almost always are going to want to leave this BIP44 just as default. You're only ever going to want to change that in a recovery situation. So if we go up into these dots and click in the settings, what can we do? We can chat. Who are we chatting with? Okay, this is a support chat. Let's not talk to them. We can use Wallet Connect for like other browser-based things. That's great. Send feedback, referral program, card settings. What can we do? Get your card ready. Okay, so let's say scan card. We'll just use this one on the bottom. Put in the pin. Say continue. So what can we actually do? Okay, so we can see the card ID issuer. We can see it's signed zero hashes. We can change access code, factory reset. So we can actually wipe these cards and reuse them if we want to set them up with a new wallet. Change access code. So we'll set the access code. So let's go into app settings. So we can turn biometric. Keep the wallet in the app, save access code, but you'll still need to tap for all transactions. Oh yes, here we go. We can change the currency to any of those. If I get another device, say this iPhone here, and just scan it. So just using a different phone and tapping the card brings up all of our accounts uh, that we had there before. So the other thing I'm curious about is what happens if we forget our pin. So let's just say, forgot your code. Access code. Well, let's just say 0000. 0000. zero, zero. zero, 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 zero. And say continue. Reset access code. Tap the card you want to restore. First, repair the card for the restore process. Okay. Tap a backup card. Okay, so this one here is the backup card. Tap the card you want to restore. Code was reset successfully. Okay, so now this card should have the code of 0000 to get in. So if someone has two of your cards, you're stuffed. The fact that anyone who gains access to more than one of your cards gains full access to everything without pins, without access codes, without anything should be really highlighted, you know, bold, red text, big warnings and written on the cards themselves. Yeah, the good thing when it comes to these access codes is it's actually something Tangem have fixed in their 2.0 hardware, even though they've sort of basically buried it, you know, right down the bottom in their change notes. Meaning if you have the 2.0 version of the cards, you can essentially disable the ability for one or more of the cards to be able to be used to reset the access code on the other cards. So let's see what happens if we get it wrong 20 times. Okay, so it's getting longer each time by one second. Okay, that's fair enough. So let's see if it goes back to zero if I get it right. And now that I got that right once, we be back to fast login. Yes. So in terms of open source, if we jump onto Tangent's GitHub, they actually do have things like an SDK for these cards on there uh, for Java and Android as well as iOS. And they also have the source for their actual apps. So basically, even if the company were to disappear tomorrow, it would be possible for community members to actually publish their own wallet software just so that people could recover their funds. And in addition to the source code being there, there's actually good documentation on their developer portal as well that tells you a whole bunch of information about the card, you know, how to use it, how to develop for them, and so on. When it comes to the cards themselves, these cards are closed source and will stay that way just because the internal uh, hardware and functionality of these cards is something that Samsung will be guarding behind an NDA that very likely prevents Tangem from releasing the source that runs on these cards. The Tangem do reference a security audit that was done on the firmware and you can actually jump onto that company's website and find a very brief summary of that here. Okay, summary time. So I think the first thing that's important to say is devices like these Tangent wallets are really not in the same category as something like a Ledger or a Trezor or some other device that allows you to verify transaction data, seed words and things like that on the physical hardware wallet itself. 
because they're aiming at such a low price point and such a simple user experience, they simply don't have a lot of the security features that more advanced and more expensive hardware wallets often have. And if you want to understand more about those sorts of features and why they're important, you can see this video that I did on the topic here. That said, even though these devices do provide a level of security that sits somewhere between a hot wallet and something like a standard Trezor or a Ledger, you know, they still make an important contribution into the space in that a lot of people do mess up by giving their seed phrase away. A lot of people do mess up by having hot wallets on their devices. And you know, the Tangem definitely tries to provide a solution to that and to do so at a very accessible price point and to provide a user experience that's really not that much worse than just a hot wallet on your phone. I've added the device to my hardware wallet comparison website, though uh, you can see it actually doesn't do very well. And if you wanna understand why it scores poorly compared to these other devices, you can actually just click through to the full spreadsheet and you'll see that the low security score is primarily due to the fact that it doesn't let you verify anything in terms of receive addresses, uh, verify transaction details for sending and so on. So if you're someone who's just really after low cost and ease of use, or perhaps uh, you might be a more advanced user who just wants a simple device that you just sort of carry in your wallet with you for you know small to medium amounts of crypto or something like that, you know, this might be a device for you. If you think that a tangent wallet would help boost the security of your setup and would like to help me in the process, go an affiliate link in the description. And if you have any questions or comments about the device, just leave a reply in the YouTube comment section. I'll do my best to reply to all of them. Thanks for watching. I hope that was helpful. Hit like if you think that other people would find this video useful and hit subscribe if you'd like to be kept in the loop about future content I make that helps people stay safe in the crypto space and to recover if they get into trouble. If you have any questions about this video or a topic that you'd like me to cover, just leave a reply.